Thanks, Jeremy. All right, well, I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about myself, just for those who don't know me. Um, I'm a CS and EE student from the University of Illinois. That was a while ago. I'm also an MBA and MIS graduate from Washington University. That's in St. Louis. Uh, for 26 years, I've either been a developer or working with NI software, mostly LabVIEW. So I assume that applies to everybody in the room. Um, I've worked with the LabVIEW Champions Group for the, my champions that are in the team in the room. Um, since that team was first created, it's a much bigger team these days. This is my fifth GDevCon event from a worldwide perspective. Um, so I have presented at a couple of these sessions. There's almost no chance that I'm going to cover all the slides uh, that I have in this deck, but I'll leave them all there for reference for people who want to see them afterwards. Um, I had, did give a warning to the GDevCon board over here that they're going to need to use the hook on me at some point, so you're going to see them flashing numbers at me. That's how long I have left, uh, which, by the way, I'll start my own timer. All right. Um, I don't know everything about generative AI, but I'm happy to share what I do know with you and learn from you. And at this point, I do want to recognize uh, Beth from Milwaukee Tools. If you like today's session, you can thank her, because last year at this event, she talked my ear off at dinner after the event was over about generative AI. She had a million questions, and I realized right away, if she has a million questions, I bet that this topic would be useful to a lot of people in the room. So I want to present on this and share what I do know, and hopefully we can learn a thing or two together. However, if you don't like this session, come talk to me. That's my fault. I'm a terrible presenter. Um, I also just spent 16 days visiting U.S. national parks, mostly here in the uh, western part of the United States with my family. It was an awesome vacation. I'm happy to talk your ear off about it after the session um, if you want to know about where we went, but it does influence the next slide. So. In the grand scheme of these th things, all are about our giants are female when we go to GDevCon events. Um, Mary Jane Coulter, does anybody know who this woman was? Sweet. People who are familiar with the national parks probably got this one. Um, she was a chief architect and designer for the Fred Harvey Company. If you don't know who the Fred Harvey Company is, you're not from the west, part of the United States. Um, she blended Spanish colonial mission and Native American style. She created an almost entirely unique um, experience in the buildings that she designed for the Fred Harvey Company. Um, it's really popular without, uh, throughout the US uh, Southwest. There are 21 buildings that are credited to her name. Many of those are still national historical monuments. I visited a lot of them on my trip, and that's why I picked her. Um, in the Grand Canyon, as an example, these are the buildings that I have down here, is the Hopi House and the, um, the Desert View Watchtower and the Bright Animal Lodge. For anybody who visited the South Rim of the Grand Canyon, you've seen these three buildings. They're very prominent. And if you went to the Petrified Forest National Park, you'll have seen the Painted Desert Inn. It's right at the entrance off of Route 40. You can't miss it. Um, you have to go through it. And uh, it, these are all just really unique buildings. Uh, she was one of the only women who were architects in her timeline. All right, so I always appreciated that Norm and other presenters put this up front, so I like listing this slide. I have an objective for today's presentation. I'm going to do a general um, generative AI uh, discussion. This is meant as informational and show some ways that it can help for everybody in the room. Uh, to do that, I'm going to provide a basic AI primer just so we're all on the same page. I'm going to discuss some of the generative AI capabilities um, that you might be familiar with or that you might see um, in your workplace. And then I'm going to introduce some of the challenges um, that um, we see in the test industry and NI's vision for how generative AI can address those challenges. This will not make you a generative AI expert. You won't leave here thinking, I know everything there is to know about generative AI. I just want to set that expectation up front. However, I hope it will make you curious enough to want to learn more, because this is a really important topic. Um, in my head, this is early 1990. In early 1990, the World Wide Web wasn't a thing. Um, the internet didn't exist. Can anybody in this room name anything that you've done since you woke up this morning that didn't involve the internet in some way. 
I mean, look at that short of a time span, 1990 to 2024, you're talking about 30 years. In 30 years, one technology completely changed the way that we do everything. And nobody in 19, I don't care who they were, nobody in 1990 could have predicted all the ways that that was gonna change our lives. Um, I think generative AI is that next technology that is gonna fundamentally change everything we do. And we don't know all the ways that it's gonna do that. But we have some ideas of things that can work. All right, so for those of you who've never done this with me before, I'm gonna have polling questions throughout here. You're welcome to take this screenshot. It'll show up every time there's a polling question. So you can use any browser interface you have. You can snapshot the QR code with your phones or you can use a browser on your laptop or your phone, however you wanna do it. Um, but that's the URL for the polling. The questions will stay there for a while as we go through things until the next question that I pull up. So, in the name of things, here's the first question. How much do you currently know about generative AI? Hey, thank you, whoever would jumped on that one right away to show me that this is all working today. That's fantastic. <laughs> Aha, there, I was waiting for the person to say, yep, I'm Tony Stark. <laughs> I had to be one in the room. Okay, the good news is, um, for everybody who's answered this question, you're all gonna learn something. <laughs> this session is definitely meant for you. All right, so the basic the breakdown here, there's some people who don't know anything. There's some people who understand that generative AI is a, is a word. Um, there's some people who, who've experimented with it, and there's Tony Stark. Okay, now a different question kind of getting at a different point. How do you actually feel about generative AI? I watched, I don't know how many people in the room have watched the podcast um, that Nancy and Sam and others do called the, This Month in LabVIEW. I watched one of, their, um, one of their podcasts where they talked about generative AI and it went everywhere from this is just crap and it's never gonna turn into anything to it seems really cool but it's not really applied to me yet. Okay, more of this room than I expected. I'm using generative AI tools occasionally and I'm encouraged by what I've seen so far. That's awesome. It also tells you a little bit about how fast this technology is evolving, which is like a common theme, right? If I'd asked this question in 1991 about the internet, most of the room would have said, what's that? <laughs> All right, so let's talk first about kind of a primer, AI machine learning, uh, primer. So I'm going to start with a little bit of history. So we're going to go back to 1956. Everybody familiar with the name of Alan Turing? He designed the Turing test. He did a lot of work for us in the, the World War II. Um, basically, he created the field of artificial intelligence. He theorized that we could make machines that could carry on conversations and fool a person talking to it into thinking it was another person. So the whole idea of machine, of artificial intelligence was seek to produce a machine that could produce artificial intelligence. Now, there was a lot of money pumped into this in the early 50s and the 60s, and eventually the whole thing kind of fizzled out. The primary reasons for things fizzling out at that point, they really, they discovered how quickly they were running out of, the machines just couldn't handle the compute space. Um, there was not enough storage. They, they had investigated what, what went into psychology. They were trying to replicate you know, idea, neural networks, the, the idea of, of make a machine that has actually, they understand that operates like the brain does. And they just didn't have the machine power. There wasn't a computer that could handle that. They could do basic things, but they couldn't really mimic the brain. It's a very complicated organ. Um, so then you kind of fast forward into um, the late 90s. And in the late 90s, they introduced uh, machine learning. So they, they now had faster computers. There was more possibility that they could invest in this. Anybody remember what significant event happened in 1997? There's a break, sorry? Deep Blue. Deep Blue, that's right. So Deep Blue came along as an IBM creation. And what could Deep Blue do that no, no machine had done before? could play chess and it could beat the world champion Kasparov, right? So that was a pretty big deal. Chess is a fairly complicated game. It involves a lot of um, 
deep thinking to think multiple moves ahead, and this machine could do that, and it could reliably do that. And that was a pretty big deal to people. And so you started seeing more money moving back into this space because now machines had caught up to the point where, okay, it can do complex stuff, and that's neat. Um, then 2012, you, you jump a few uh, decade later, um, and then you get this deep learning concept. And 2012 was another one of those uh, benchmark years. Does everybody remember what significant machine event happened in 2012? Yeah, IBM's still kicking a kicking butt in that area. It created Watson. What could Watson do? Watson could beat both Jeopardy champions at the time. So it couldn't just beat one person, it could beat multiple people. And it could do that while fooling a whole lot of people that it was another person, it was an actual contestant. So now you've taken, it doesn't just play chess, it can understand rules, now it can abstract thinking. Okay, that's pretty significant. So now you see more money getting um, pulled into this. And we get to 2021 and 2022, and these buzzwords of generative AI come up, and that's because there's now significant computing power out there to do a lot of the complex stuff that we couldn't do before. All right, so that's kind of the history of, of building. Now, where we are right now, okay, it's early 1990s. The internet's a thing now. And it has a lot of potential, but there's nobody out there who's really mastered it. There's nobody out there who's like dominating the space, and it's certainly not prevalent in our day-to-day -day lives the way that the internet is today. So there's a couple ways that you can think about it. How many people in the room are um, the dreamers? Like, I think it's gonna be the most awesome thing ever, and I can't wait for this future. Only a handful, okay, that's fine. Um, how many people are basically our technologists going, this seems like a pretty cool technology, I wanna learn a lot about it, and I can see where we can apply it in the future. More of this room, it's great. All right, how many, come on, I know there's people here. How many of them are skeptics of, eh, I think it's a flash in the pan, if you talk about it in another decade, I think it's dead and gone. <laughs> Yeah, there's a couple of you. And then how many people are the, oh my gosh, we just, what happened to the? <laughs> don't, don't touch the cable. <laughs> don't, it's important not to touch the cable. Okay, how many people are my, oh man, we just created the next apocalypse, the robots are gonna take over and kill us all. <laughs> all right, now here's the fun fact about where we, where we are today, you're all right. Every one of you has a completely valid point in this. Um, I'm not gonna try to convince you that robots won't take over if we're not real careful about it. I'm also not gonna try to convince you that this technology is going to revolutionize the way we do things and you can't possibly understand all the ways that that'll change over the next 30 years. All right, so I talked about this a little bit in the history, but some of the things that changed that allowed us to do this, first, we have the compute power. We can do billions of petaflops on the training for these models. That wasn't possible before. I mean, I can't even, <laughs> do you know how many zeros are on a petaflop? <laughs> these are massive computers and there is so much getting pumped into this that they're just gonna get bigger. Um, the internet itself, so that revolutionary technology I talked about in the 90s is largely responsible for the scale at which we can apply these things. We couldn't have a single machine that could do everything that needs to be done in these deep learning models. It takes connecting all of these different computer devices and network centers together to be able to handle all the data that goes into training these um, learning models. And then finally, the architecture. We have billions to trillions of network parameters. When you talk about managing multiple, like massive data sets, that architecture, the ability to handle that type of data didn't exist before. It, these three things are all colliding to allow us to be able to build these um, capabilities for the first time. And it's that evolution and how fast that's now going to change that's driving everything that we're seeing. All right, so let's talk about like traditional AI versus generative AI, because they do a little bit of different things. So in your traditional AI, the way you were teaching things is you would teach it the difference between um, objects. 
So it could do classifications. You give it a thousand pictures of a cat, and it would therefore learn all these things look like cats, so they're cats. And then you give it a thousand pictures of a dog, and it would say, okay, all of these things get classified as dog. And as a result, if you gave it a picture of some animal that wasn't in either of those two sets, it could distinguish enough to say, well, there's similar characteristics, this is likely a dog. Okay, so that's how traditional AI works. In a generative AI model, you actually have a completely different abstraction. So in this model, you've just given it Instagram, for lack of a better term. You've given it every picture that ever existed anywhere. And the language model says, okay, I've started pulling out things that are patterns in all of these images, and I can classify the differences between these things are likely cats and these things are likely dogs, and nobody had to, put that in a category for me. And as a result, if you ask the generative AI engine, give me a picture of a dog, it can construct a new image that's a dog. It's not classifying things, although it can also do classifications. It's generating things. And that is a massive difference in the compute power and, and the engineering that's required to go through that. That is effectively how our brains operate. I can construct an image, if you say dog, I can construct an image of a dog even though you didn't show me a picture. <clears throat> All right, traditional AI stuff could do a lot of things. So it was already, I bet that there's examples that are on this slide that people were already doing, most notably things like predictive maintenance or just in time um, kind of sampling, uh, waveform anomaly detections, um, outlier examples when you're looking at large data sets. These were all things that are basically pattern match give you a, a list of things and I show you something and you can tell me what bucket it belongs into. <clears throat> um, as we go forward, because the compute, the models, the applications, all of these things are evolving, um, you're gonna see things, they're, they're this you know, AI model garden basically has two functions for it. The capabilities is one lever that you're gonna see as um, different engines try to differentiate themselves from each other and then the computing power required. So you are gonna see a really large spectrum, right? There's a couple of things like, do I need this thing to operate in a vacuum? I'm not connected to the internet, so I have limited space, I have limited compute power, but I can still use generative AI engines. It'll just be a smaller model, right? It'll have to fit on the device that you're trying to make it run on, and so it'll have less capabilities. Um, Whereas if you have infinite commute power and you're willing to connect it to everything in the world, you're gonna end up with things like you know, GPT-4 and other models that are uh, more expensive, um, but they also have additional capabilities. And as both those things achieve, you'll get more functionality at the lower end. My phone will be able to do a lot of things without being connected to any other device. And you will get much more powerful engines um, you'll get artist renditions of, create me a painting that makes me feel happy. And it knows enough about you to understand what would make you happy and it'll generate an image. It doesn't work real well today. I asked my favorite um, engine to generate me a presentation that would teach everybody everything I know about uh, generative AI and that resulting slide deck I threw out. So <laughs> you got this instead. All right, so let's talk about where this kind of fits in things. Um, if you're a test engineer, you work in the test industry, which I hope a lot of you do, um, you have lots of different phases. It starts with requirements and specifications and test plans, you write some code, you have to test the code, you get some quality stabilization, you have all of this data you collect from the testing that you do, you look at ways to optimize the improvement, and um, it's, it's a lot. Um, if you have to do all of this yourself, it's an almost overwhelming a lot. Um, and in the past, traditional AI domain, where it would fit, it could do the pattern matching stuff, right? You give it enough data, and it could help you see things to help find patterns so that you could do predictive maintenance. And that's cool, but that's only part of the job. So the generative AI piece is actually fairly useful for doing a lot of those upfront things. If you give it a list of requirements, as an example, it can pull out the things that you need to be able to test for. It can build your test plans for you, and then with the right amount of um, tweaking and input, it can also start generating code to do some of that testing. So kind of looking at where else things can play and expanding the range of what's possible is 
the, where we're on the, the border of, right? This is what's exciting about where we are uh, right now. Um, and then in addition, when you're doing that production test code and you're looking for samples, um, there's room for there to be, you know, generative AI can also help do a lot of the analytics. Um, and there are tools that already exist uh, that kind of fit in that space too. All right, so now to back to the question I asked about where you fit for how you felt about things. Um, AI has a risk, just like the internet has a risk. Does anybody remember my presentation from last year? It's a, it's a question for who was here. What was my topic? Security, security right? In particular, security around networking, because um, safety and security of the internet is a really uh, palpable thing. And the AI has the exact same risks and then multiplied, because this is a machine that can think it actually can make its own decisions, right? So you've got to train it. <laughs> if I'm thinking about this in the most, you know, best sense, I have to make a machine that thinks ethically, right? It has to make good decisions um, about what it does. So you don't just have to be worried about reliability, you have to be worried about things like privacy and security and uh, explainability, you can't allow it to make decisions in a black box when you don't understand what it's doing, right? So um, kind of there's this risk matrix of like all the things that you need to be able to do. So right now, if you were to look at the different things that you're probably using, if you gave in, in that question that I asked about, like, are you using a lot of technology? And a lot of you answered, yes, we are. I would bet that most of you are using um, AI augmentation to some degree, right? You're using ChatGPT and you asked it a question, you get its response, then you look at what it gave you and you decide, do I wanna use this or do I wanna modify what it did? Right, so that's a, t a tool that helped the user do their job. But you didn't let the tool do the job for you. The reason that that's probably, we, la we label it as a safe bet. The reason we label that as a safe bet is it, it's explainable, you can actually see what it gave you as a result and you can change it and if you're willing to, you can provide what you changed back to the engine so it makes better selections next time, right? You can train the model. Um, so that's one. Um, from the, you know, kind of risk field, uh, there's, then there's the, like, um, the AI automates and the human oversees. So that is, I've got the big red button here. I'm letting the machine make the decisions. But if it does something wrong, I can override it. Right, so that gives a little bit more risk because now you're saying, well, I attached that AI engine to this giant robotic arm and it's in the factory and if it makes the wrong move, I'm gonna decapitate a bunch of humans in the room, right? So now there's more risk in there of like it doing the thing correctly, but honestly, a lot of that risk was already there the moment you decided you could automate that piece of machinery in the first place, right? Divide by zero error moves a giant arm to the wrong location and bad things happen. So um, responsible automation, where the, the humans are overseeing, that's kind of your next phase. The last phase that I feel like we'll get to is, in my head, this is years from now. In reality, it could be next year. I'm, it kind of depends on how aggressive some of these companies are about how they want to do things, but you have a black box AI, you trust the producer of that is doing all the right things. They have security, they have um, good privacy practices, um, they're reliable, and you trust them. So you've given them black box domain and their AI spits out um, answers to do. So there's a lot of risk there, but the machine can probably do a lot of those things faster. So as long as you trust it, you're gonna increase your output. So there's gonna be a lot of push to move in that direction simply from a speed of getting things done, um, but you gotta watch it. And then the last one is the human's out of the loop entirely, you just toss this over the wall and the machine does everything. I'll be honest, this is the one that I'm a little terrified of. I, I, I just, like, even because, even though I'm interested in this and I think it's cool, um, I hope it's a while before we get to that point. <laughs> Especially when you talk about things like national defense. <laughs> so, um, all right. 
so this, uh, I wanna, there's a couple of these slides in that I put in here. Because I'm from NI, I'm gonna talk about NI's stance on things. So at NI, um, we, we've been thinking about this for a number of years. Um, we've established policies that align with NISD best practices, and we have, that is an active, um, always evolving group. Um, we develop and build responsible AI training for all the employees who are actually working on developing these technologies in NI so that we are all doing the same type of actions. We all have ethical responsibility for the engines that we produce and we're using them in a way that is consistent with best practices. Um, and then we conduct risk assessments before we ever allow people, other people to use them, before we allow any of our other internal teams to use them, we vet what the risks are of using that technology, and we've documented what the risks look like so that people make informed decisions about, yeah, this is a scenario where I'm willing to accept that risk, and I will build testing procedures around it in order to minimize the risk that it represents. Um, last year, if you'll remember, I had all these fun slides about the Emerson merger, we're all excited, but we can't talk about it, sorry. <laughs> the Emerson merger has happened, so we can talk about it a lot now. Um, and in merging with Emerson, we were really excited to learn Emerson had also been investigating AI, and they had similar best practices already in place, and we could simply merge all of our uh, generative AI work and our oversight committee into what Emerson was working on as a whole. So now there's a steering committee across all of Emerson's business divisions, um, which has this same, uh, a set of practices and policies in place. So as you see technology evolve, we want to be on the leading edge. We believe that generative AI will help in the test industry and we want to help you do that. But when you see our solutions, understand that we won't push the boundary on some of those machine-only sides until we're confident that we can put good policies and security in place to protect those systems and to protect you and your your teams. All right, with that in mind, this is the first, I'm gonna show this slide several times so you don't have to take this picture right away, but um, if you're interested in, gen, in uh, joining our LabVIEW um, AI Assistant Tech Preview Program, so we have one that's already there for LabVIEW. Um, this is our early access request. Um, this next section that I'm gonna talk about will explain why um, that's not a, just an open um, session for everybody to come and join. It, it, it does require an approval process. There's a bunch of NDAs and stuff that are in place. Um, and we're, for lack of a better term, taking it slow with what we enable the AI engine to do. All right, so is everybody in the room interested in seeing some of the things that the generative AI assistant that I just showed that slide for can do? Yeah? All right, all right, so, <laughs> good. I. 19 minutes, okay. Well, this will be fun. Okay, so let's talk about um, how it operates. Right now, um, it operates in two modes. So you can launch it directly from LabVIEW. This is using the current, our generative AI engine is using the current version of LabVIEW. Greg back there can correct me if I'm wrong. All the hooks are in place for the engine in the 2024 Q3 version that we just shipped, yes? Or that we will ship, it's still July. So we will ship in a few weeks. Okay. All right, it's already live. Um, however, the generative AI pieces aren't actually in it, right? So it requires um, creating an account and logging in to be able to use the thing. But the version of LabVIEW that you would have with that has everything needed for LabVIEW to function that way. Um, all right, so the, it operates in these two modes. Um, you can launch a window. It, ha it then brings up the um, generative AI assistant, which you can then interact with. Um, we have it doing a couple of samples, and in the tech preview program, our intention is uh, to do the, you're working directly with our dev team. So when you're in the program, our dev team will contact you, they'll start working with you, they'll give you some examples to go through. They wanna know what you're interested in using, and we are tracking, so this comes down to the data privacy question, we are tracking everything on the back end that you do, which is another reason why we didn't just turn it on. That would not be an acceptable practice in the grand scheme of things. But here, what we're trying to do is learn what's the most common things people try to do and then how much does that require? Because these are all costs, right? So how much does that require from a token standpoint uh, to perform those actions? And then what we're trying to learn is, can we modify LabVIEW and other parts of our software portfolio to minimize those tokens so that you can do all of that functionality as often as you want without it being a giant cost, right? We want to minimize all the costs involved for everybody. 
All right, so you can do things like find examples. So you can say, hey, Nigel, can you find me some examples that do these things? And it'll go through and find examples that it does. Jim, I saw him earlier is here. He's got a, a version that he's posted about in LinkedIn several times, which is actually one step beyond what Nigel currently does. And it searches the whole internet trying to find you examples. We did not try to make our tool do that. Um, we limited it to what the scope of NI owns and where we thought we could uh, best optimize our tokens. Um, but you can quickly see how um, you would want to be able to do a search that isn't just find me examples that I've already written or that somebody else at my company has written, but find me examples anywhere that exist that I might want to look at, okay? Um, it can also do things like create me a VI. So you can say, write a VI that duplicates from an array of numbers and it will then generate a VI that does that functionality. I will later show you that there are lots of limitations with what it can do today. But again, we're in the infancy of the internet. So we want to show the possibility of what it can do in the interest of, is this the thing that's most useful for what people need to be able to do? Because code generation is only one piece of that huge diagram I showed, right? So we, we didn't want to like, take everything to its full conclusion. We want to experiment with all the different things that it can do. Um, it can do some diagnostics, so you can say, hey, here's a VI that I'm working on. You can actually give it the VI. And you can say, this VI isn't working as expected. What's up? <laughs> now, the fun thing is you can actually tell it what's up, and it understands what that means. Um, so it'll give you a list of, like, oh, well, I noticed some things about your VI. And what's the best way I can put this? One of them might have something to do with the actual problem. <laughs> So if you read all of the things that it gave you, there's a pretty good chance that at least one of them um, has to do with the actual problem, and the rest of them might be interesting, um, but don't really contribute to the problem. So training the model how to do that better is actually part of the active work. Now, here's one of the things that it can do really, really well, which is probably my favorite feature, because Darren and I argued about this all the time, and uh, George, our old buddy, was always better at this than I was, but I'm gonna give it a VI. The VI works perfectly. It is something that I loved, and I, I took a lot of time on, but I didn't document anything. Nobody else will ever be able to read this. It'll take you hours to understand what the VI does. Darren's whole presentation is probably built on somebody like me. <laughs> Just being honest. Um, so, you can say, hey, Nigel, here's the VI. Please tell me what it does. And it will go through and actually tell you, okay, here's the logic for what it does. Do you want me to like, document the VI? For? I can drop this whole just verbose text of what the VI does into the block diagram. You want me to do that? And you're like, yes, sounds great. 13 minutes, okay. <clears throat> Um, and then kind of the last thing that it can do, is, uh, you can ask it, um, help me with the VI. So this is related to kind of code generation, but it's more along the lines of, um, here's a VI and I wanna be able to make changes to it that do the following things. How would I do that? So it's not generating a VI from scratch, now it's taking something that you used as a starting point and saying, okay, how would I augment that to do the new functionality you wanna do? And then if you want to do, <laughs> this probably doesn't apply to anybody in the room, but maybe I'll, I'll just keep going. Uh, if you don't know how to do something that LabVIEW can do, you can ask it, hey, I've got this VI, it works great. I'd like to build it into an executable. How do I do that? And it'll tell you, here's the steps for how you build executables in LabVIEW. You can ask it to do just about anything, but that's one of the things that comes up frequently. Um, because we also make, you know, all of our test systems, when we look at test systems, we also wanted it to be able to interact with our hardware and our driver interfaces, and so you can ask the assistant, um, tell me about this NI hardware device and how to use it. And I'll say, okay, on this system, you're connected to the following devices, which one do you want me to describe? And you can say, okay, I want you to tell me about the USB device that's attached to it, and it'll go through a rundown of here's all of the inputs and parameters for that device. You can find all of this stuff in the documentation, or you could simply ask the agent and it'll just give it to you. Which one would you rather do? I'd rather ask the other agent. All right, so if I haven't, I got 12 minutes, I'm gonna start it. 
So let's talk a little bit about how that works. All right, trick, que trick question, and nobody from JKI gets to answer this because you all ruined our um, NI Week presentation because you knew the answer. What language is Nigel programmed in? English, it's programmed in English, it's a really trick question. It's one of the coolest things about generative AI, you don't have to learn a programming language in order to interact with the models. You gotta learn programming languages if you wanna build the models, but you don't have to in order to interact with them and in order to do a lot of the programming evolved around like training the model. You're using English, it's all called, many people have heard the term prompt engineering. You're gonna get really familiar. This is like saying, how many people have heard the phrase um, TCP IP or HTTP, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a building block of generative AI and the way that prompt engineering works, this is all in English. So you can do things like, I can tell the generative AI model, all right, so you build this big model and now it's sitting there and it's waiting for you to tell it stuff. And as the system user, I tell the language model, you're a pirate. This was maybe the most hilarious example I'd ever seen when I first got introduced to what we were building. All right, so the dev team had been working on it for months. And they came back with this example and, and I just, I laughed. I was like, what are you, why? And they're like, because it's cool, watch. So I, I, I tell the language model, you're a pirate. The size of the language model understands what that means. I didn't have to teach it. Well, that means you talk with a lot of R's and you're swaggering a sword around. You're a pirate, that's all you told it. And then the language model says, okay, fine, all my responses that I give will be based on I'm a pirate. So it puts that as the context for its response. The user then says, hello, engine. And the engine says, oi, matey, what brings you to the fine ship today? I don't know why it's a ship. Uh, be it treasure you seek or tales on the high seas, speak up and I'll lend you your ear. Um, okay, cool. So the way you interact and you train the model is just all in straight up English. Um, fine tuning is the way that you take your base LLM, so your large language model, that's the, the sum total of everything that it knows in the universe. You add in a data set to it, so you teach it how to be specific, like you know more um, after fine tuning about how to interact with DAC devices than the large language model did by itself. And now your system prompt and your user prompt go through a fine-tuned model that knows how to behave better for your specific scenario. And being able to do that fine-tuning is a piece of what we're adding in, in our generative AI program. So the, the responses that you get from it are more trained on how to build test and measurement systems. Okay, um, text models by default as they stand today can't understand VIs, not directly. So you need to define an intermediate form. So we've trained, we've taught our tool how to take VIs, turn them into a type of text, and you use that text to generate the training material that you're using to augment your um, large language model. Um, some of the things that allows you to do, you can do things like semantic searches. So a typical search, when you type in a word into a browser, it simply says, I will find an exact match for that word. A semantic search, when you type in that word, it says, I understand what that word means and I will search for things that are related to that meaning. So I can use the word good and it understands, well, good can mean the opposite of bad or good can mean it's not as good as best or good can mean a lot of things. I understand what that word means and I'll find things that are good. Okay, how many people have heard the phrase rag? Rag training, yeah, 10 minutes, all right. It's cool. <laughs> we'll just stop when we hit the time. Um, anybody heard retrieval augmented generation? No, it's a room full of no's, okay. So um, in our uh, training, uh, we've given it um, an additional um, augmentation um, to learn from and that it, it gives it a a better way of doing the search. Um, so you can have a Q&A discussion um, with the, the data and the, the, the RAG generated database understands the enhanced context around what you're doing. It's another way of um, augmenting um, the large language model. 
So this is just giving you a little bit of overview of how the thing works. So on your machine, Nigel is part of LabVIEW, and there's an AI add-on that gets added to it. That's not in the AI add-ons, not in the typical LabVIEW shipping, but all of the LabVIEW code knows how to handle the engine when it's there. So this is on the user's machine, and there's a separate UI for the chat window, so you're, you can talk to the engine. Um, whatever you type in as your um, prompt, that goes up to our AI service where we've got user authentication, so you need to be able to log into the thing in order to be able to use it. It has a vector database with all of our uh, augmented data in it, so it understands the context. You're operating in LabVIEW, you're probably doing a test and measurement system, and I add all of that context into your query. And then we pass all of that um, to the fine-tune LLMs, which is in an Azure cloud. And both of those things are secured network connections, but they are network connections. So right now, our model only operates when you're connected to an internet. You cannot operate in a vacuum. OK, a couple things that I want to cover because they're hilarious um, or useful. In this case, um, how do you evaluate the, how good the code is? I mentioned before that I have, I've asked the engine to do things, and it gives back inappropriate responses sometimes. So there's a couple of different ways that we use. There's lots of models out there. This, will, this is one of those areas that will continue evolving, and these um, training tools will get better and better. Um, right now, we're using um, OpenAI's human eval. It's a series of tests that says, how well did the, you know, when I perform all these tests, how well did the code that get generated actually do the task I asked it to do? Um, in addition, we use a, map, a metric to decide how good our engine is when we make changes to it. Did we make it better or worse? Um, that metric's called pass it K, um, and it's basically a probability. It says, what's the probability that at least one of the generated responses that the engine gave me back? You notice that a lot of times when I asked a question, it gave you like, here's five different selections that you might have. What's the probability that at least one of those generated responses is correct and better than what I was doing before? So we keep track of like when we make changes to it, did it get better or worse? Because sometimes <laughs> that's the way this science works right now. You're experimenting. And so when you try to make something better, sometimes you actually made it worse and you need to go understand why did that happen. All right, there's a bunch of challenges. In addition to like how do we keep track of stuff and how do we keep evolving and making better, there's a bunch of challenges with generative AI development. You have to find the right technique. Can you use semantic searches? Can you use prompt engineering? Are you using rags? Do you have a fine-tuned model? All of those choices do things to your costs and your ability to do things in a vacuum or are connected to the internet. Um, you have rapidly changing AI stacks. We designed our engine so that we could replace the back end if we found a better engine that worked at some point in the future. Um, but those are going to quickly evolve, and there's lots of competing models. I'm going to give you my personal opinion on this. What, no matter what anybody says, you, come, you have somebody come to you and they say, this thing is the best model and everything else is crap. They're wrong. Lots of engines are good. They are all good at doing different things, and they will continue to evolve very, very fast. So they have differences between them, but they're all good at doing different things. Um, you need to optimize for your token count so you can keep your costs down. Those tokens are how you keep track of what's getting passed to the internet and what's getting passed to the backend servers. And they charge you on a token count basis for each of those interactions. So the more you can um, optimize those token counts, the lower you can keep your costs while still getting the right results you're looking for. Um, there's some challenges. <laughs> this is a slide I was desperate to get to because it's just hilarious. Um, sometimes it's difficult to perform qualitative assessment of the results. So no matter what you were trying to do, sometimes you just can't tell, is this thing better or not? Eh, I'm just going to have to say it's at least as good. Moving on. Um, the chat interface is very open-ended. You can ask it anything, and it can respond with anything. And because of that, it's really hard to just say, did it not understand my question, or is it answering it in a way that I didn't predict? Right? Is my English poor, and the machine was answering the question that I'd asked, I, because I asked the question poorly? And then, how many people have heard the phrase, uh, generative AI hallucinations? Yeah, OK. You guys have experimented with this, because this comes up all the time. So 
the original prompt, this one, I have to share this one, so this is real things that happen like behind the scenes as our dev team was working on it. The original prompt was, Nigel, this BI isn't doing what I want. What's wrong with the BI? And Nigel said, okay, well, you should ensure each step reflects accurate settings pertinent to your specific hardware setup and intended measurement requirements before running the BI in an actual LabVIEW environment on target systems connected properly according to their documented guidelines. Okay, that didn't actually help answer the question, but it's not, Weird, it's cool. And then Nigel did this. <laughs> after checking all points, I'm gonna draw a deep breath. If after checking all points above, you still encounter issues during execution, such as error codes and unexpected behavior, please provide detailed information about what occurs when you run this BI, including error code messages displayed as LabVIEW, which would help me <gasps> give more context, specific advice tailored towards resolving those particular problems encountered during this virtual instrument file within context of NI software platform utilities alongside associated hardware apparatuses deployed therein, went legal for some reason, for carrying out automated test measurement procedures according as part thereof overall system integration overflow processes involved thereby overall end-to-end -end solution deployments, life cycle stages, it, and then this part just cracks me up, encompassed therewithin effectively, efficiently, expediently, excellently, exceptionally, extraordinarily, remarkably, superbly, tremendously, wonderfully, magnificent, fantastically, fabulously great. <laughs> Done, I went home. <laughs> All right, so um, further concept explorations, we're really not gonna get to this, so um, I'm gonna just kinda skip ahead. There's some other stuff that we're ex um, excited about being able to trial. Did anybody go to NI Week, uh, NI Connect, I'm sorry, <laughs> this year? Yeah, okay, then you saw this demo. I'm leaving the slides in here. We showed an example of go investigate a test plan and then pull that into something like our instrument studio and have it generate the tests for me and then put all of that into a report, send it over to System Link, do some analysis on it, and then um, schedule some tests and help me identify problem spaces. I'm gonna, there is a video in this. I'm gonna leave you guys with the slide deck so you can all go back and see it or you can see this on NI's website later. I'm not gonna show that video. Um, and I'm gonna skip directly to the end because we've got five minutes. Um, and I wanted to ask you like five questions. Okay, so now that you've participated in this discussion, how do you feel about generative AI now? I will feel a little sad if I didn't sway you at all, but I'll accept the answers. <laughs> uh oh, it, it's stuck. Uh, hold on. Stop clicking on it. Okay, now is it unstuck? Sweet. <laughs> Still just a pad. All right. Got to accept reality. I'll remind everybody that up front, I told you I was not, this was not a swaying presentation. It was informational, so I'm okay. <laughs> Siddharth, you're not firing me after this. All right, um, one thing to consider. So I wanted to put this out there just to convince my few remaining people who are still not swayed. Chip vendor stocks, these are people making the AI generative, generative AI chips. This is what's happened to them in just the last six months. So I went and pulled the end of last year through where they are today. Every single one of these companies has massively increased in their value. That type of trend hasn't been seen even since before the internet because back then it was really um, 
creation of web browsers. So none of those things existed in these companies. It was Microsoft had Windows. Thank you for showing me Windows 95 all over. That was, that was pretty awesome. But Windows could barely take advantage of the internet. Nobody remembers Windows 3.1.1, but I do. <laughs> OK. Um, but like these companies have never seen this type of dramatic shift. And this um, curve, this is a leading edge. And if, I, if this doesn't convince you, nothing I can ever say is going to convince you. So you'll just have to wait and see. And 10 years from now, you can come back and tell me, ha ha, I was right. <laughs> Maybe. Um, sorry, Jim? The leading edge of a, a revolutionary change. Like, uh, this is going to change the way that we do absolutely everything. And I, I can't tell you all the ways it's going to work. I hope I've shown you some of the examples of things that it will be capable of doing, because we can already make it do them to some degree. Um, but I can't tell you. I don't have the foresight. Um, I couldn't have predicted that I'd have this type of device um, back in 1990. I was a high school student. There was no chance that I could have told you that this is what would dominate my day-to-day -day life. Um, so I'm positive that I can't do that now. Uh, but I do believe it will fundamentally change the way we do just about everything. Um, so with that, this, this survey is just for my personal uh, feedback. I like to know that either I'm hitting the nail on the head and helping um, with the drive the success of these types of events, or that this really didn't hit the mark and I need to do something different um, for next year. So I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.